cancer of a type of white blood cell called lymphocytes and they tend to be found in lymph nodes which are under the neck, under the arms, and the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. So it is pretty frequent that lymphomas, um, when they're initially diagnosed, are found throughout the body. We think of lymphomas in a number of different categories. So one is Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Within non-Hodgkin, there are over 80 different types of lymphoma. And one other way we think of it is in terms of the slower growing or indolent lymphomas versus faster growing or aggressive lymphomas. Follicular lymphoma is the most common of the slower growing lymphomas and it's the second most common non-Hodgkin lymphoma type overall. There are about 15,000 patients in the U.S. diagnosed with follicular lymphoma every year. And it's an interesting disease because it's not so clear cut in every single patient that it should be managed in a certain way. So with some scenarios in cancer and in medicine in general, there is one clear cut way that most patients should be treated Follicular lymphoma, the approach really needs to be tailored for the individual patient. It is a disease that is very difficult to cure, and it often is a disease that someone will live with for many, many years and may not cause any symptoms at all, and so it really needs to be managed directed to the patient and how they're feeling. So often one way that I have seen it present is in someone who uh, was having a radiologic study for some other reason unrelated to lymphoma or swollen lymph nodes. Um, for example, I have some patients who are women who've had mammograms um, that found some enlarged lymph nodes in there under their arm, and then um, those lymph nodes were biopsied and showed to be follicular lymphoma. Uh, another scenario would be a patient who had a kidney stone and had a CAT scan done of his abdomen that diagnosed that and also saw some enlarged lymph nodes. In those cases, the, pa the patients are completely asymptomatic. This is a slow-growing disease, and the really the tenant of treatment is that we should only treat with active chemotherapy or other agents if the patient is symptomatic from the disease. Um, the evidence from um, many years of research shows that patients will not necessarily live longer if you treat them sooner. So even though I could give some treatment that would shrink the lymph nodes early in the course of their disease, that may just subject them to extra side effects and toxicities from the treatment without really giving them a, a long-term um, uh, benefit in terms of number of years lived. So our goal, and my, my main goal in taking care of patients with follicular lymphoma is to um, give them the highest quality of life for the longest time possible, and often that means not doing any treatment, but doing what we call active surveillance, where we see them frequently, often starting out about once every three months for lab tests and for physical exam. And, and then, of course, having them contact me if there's any changes in the interim um, that we would bring them in sooner. Um, but, but really getting them into this active surveillance mode where we're watching them frequently for um, symptoms but not actually doing any treatment unless they really are symptomatic from the disease. So some symptoms that we would look for are Occasionally people have pain associated with, with their lymph nodes or sometimes people have really bulky lymph nodes that grow, for example, in their neck that other people can notice and that might make a patient feel like they wanted to, to start treatment. Um, there are some, some particular indications for treatment, um, usually based, like I said, on size of lymph nodes if they're particularly large um, or otherwise if they're causing pain. Um, some other symptoms people could have are um, fevers or chills, night sweats. These are what we call B symptoms. And um, we do look out for those symptoms in particular in follicular lymphoma because there is a phenomenon called transformation where the follicular lymphoma could turn into a faster growing lymphoma called diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And that is typically treated with chemotherapy. Um, so we are watching for that carefully um, in all of our patients with follicular lymphoma. Um, it is a rare um, uh, occurrence. It happens about 1.5 to 3 percent um, per year for patients with follicular lymphoma. So it certainly is possible over a 15-year course of having the disease that they may um, have a transformation happen. So that is something that we watch for carefully. And um, if someone develops symptoms concerning for um, active lymphoma, we will often repeat imaging scans to assess um, the status of the disease and then we can talk about particular treatment options. Uh, so there, there really are um, multiple different ways that follicular lymphoma can be treated. 
As I mentioned, the active surveillance approach is, is often what we start with, especially in these patients who have uh, asymptomatic, asymptomatic disease. Uh, the uh, a very standard way of treating the disease is with a monoclonal antibody called rituximab. Um, this targets a protein on the surface of the lymphoma cells called CD20, and it is not chemotherapy. We would consider it really one of the earliest targeted, more specific therapies um, that helps to control the lymphoma with really pretty minimal side effects. There are some notable side effects that we, of course, would review in detail with patients. But generally speaking, they do feel um, very well and don't notice a lot of uh, changes while on that treatment. Um, the treatment for that is usually four, four doses in a row for four weeks, and then occasionally some maintenance therapy is included, but, but not always. And so it's a pretty uh, simple and straightforward way for people to be treated. There's a newer monoclonal antibody called obinutuzumab, which is being incorporated in um, usually in relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma. And there are patients who do present with more symptomatic disease. And um, for example, sometimes it can involve the fluid around the lungs um, or the fluid in the abdomen. Um, that is a time um, when people tend to feel symptomatic, sometimes with shortness of breath. And that, we would usually think, needed a quicker response. So the rituximab that I mentioned actually takes sometimes weeks to months to have a response, which is fine if the patient isn't particularly symptomatic, but if they're very symptomatic or they have these abnormal fluid collections or other um, large lymph nodes that we really feel that need to be um, decreased in size quickly, we would sometimes incorporate chemotherapy therapy into the regimen. There are a number of different chemotherapies that can be used. Um, probably the most standard is one called bendamustine in combination with rituximab, and that's given once um, every two, do two doses in a row every four weeks for six total treatments. Um, there are some newer therapies also that are uh, also that are more targeted approaches and, and are many of them are oral actually. So I think as we move forward in time, we're going to have more and more oral agents that people can actually take at home as opposed to coming into our infusion center and getting treatments intravenously. In general, for lymphomas, we like to have a complete excision of a lymph node in order to make the most accurate diagnosis. As I mentioned already, there are over 80 different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and it's very important that we figure out exactly what subtype of person has. Using um, the most tissue possible, so a, a actual lymph node excision as opposed to just a needle biopsy is preferred, um, and that's for all types of lymphoma. And um, occasionally, bone marrow biopsies can be done also to make the diagnosis. Follicular lymphoma is commonly involved in the bone marrow, so that is a procedure that, that hematologists like me do in our, in our office, and it is a straightforward procedure that, that we can um, uh, do relatively easily to obtain the diagnosis, uh, and sometimes it's done for staging purposes as well. The most common chromosomal abnormality that goes along with follicular lymphoma is called T1418. It's a translocation that involves chromosomes 14 and 18, and that can help confirm the diagnosis. The least intense approach in terms of side effects felt by patients clearly is the active surveillance uh, mode of, of watching carefully and not doing treatment initially. Rituximab would be considered the next uh, in terms of lower side effect profile uh, and, and a smaller amount of time experience for the patient actually receiving the therapy. Next approach would be chemotherapy, which is usually for a prescribed amount of time, like I said, sometimes about six months of chemotherapy. Uh, regularly three to four weeks. And then um, the newer approaches, which may become um, more standard for frontline but are, are still undergoing studies, are some newer targeted drugs. So uh, lenalidomide, um, which is an oral medication that has FDA approval for some other indications but not follicular lymphoma, is being combined with rituximab in clinical trials and is a promising therapy and is sometimes used in people who've received other treatment for follicular lymphoma and then if the uh, lymphoma grows again, they, they may receive that, that treatment. And then there are some other class of drugs called PI3 kinase inhibitors are newer medicines that are also uh, uh, some in pill, some in IV form that are targeted therapies that can be used for follicular lymphoma as well. I may meet a patient initially who is asymptomatic and we're watching the disease for a number of years and then 
at one of their regularly scheduled visits, they mention they're having some back pain or um, they're having some weight loss. And so I would then do some imaging and find that the lymphoma is growing and likely needs treatment. And so at that point, if they hadn't received any treatment, we really always include rituximab as a first line treatment. And, and sometimes that's in combination with other drugs like chemotherapy or some of the targeted drugs. Um, but certainly that's general, the backbone of the treatment strategy. And as I mentioned, there's another drug called obinutuzumab, which is also being used in a similar fashion. And um, when a patient is treated with one of these strategies, our goal is that they will have many years where they won't need any treatment. And fortunately, that does frequently happen. Um, but eventually, they, they tend to, to develop sometimes similar symptoms to the, what they had initially, or um, they might have um, some of the B symptoms I mentioned, like fevers, chills, night sweats. Um, I said weight loss, abdominal pain, these types of symptoms. And another symptom really is generalized fatigue um, that can go along with uh, progression of lymphoma as well. And at that point, we really need to see what they've already received. And if it has been a, a significant amount of time since they originally received a monoclonal antibody like rituximab, they potentially can be treated with that same agent again. We can also consider chemotherapy or some of the more targeted approaches. And we really advocate actually for clinical trials in these types of a setting as well. Sometimes people get scared of the word clinical trials, like they think that they're being experimented on or that um, that there's, um, there's some um, uh, potential risk with that clinical trial. What I want to emphasize is that sometimes the very best treatments we have could be in the form of clinical trial that is a very new and promising therapy that's not yet FDA approved. And so um, with each patient, I really think if this was my family member, my close friend, what would I recommend? And sometimes really clinical trial is the best option because we have lots of you know, really exciting new drugs that come out um, uh, sooner via clinical trial. Someone who has a relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma. We look at the treatments they've received already, see if we can include that, for example, rituximab as a single agent or um, in combination with another drug. And, and if we have um, promising clinical trial options, it's really a great time to try to incorporate one of those. I have been lucky enough to be involved in um, a a clinical research mentoring program through the Lymphoma Research Foundation and I have been I'm so amazed by this organization. The people who work for the LRF are so dedicated to uh, really improving the lives of patients with lymphoma and there's a number of different ways in which they are doing that. Um, they have programs throughout the country and, and uh, some of these are directed for patients. There are other resources available online. They have a hotline um, and so I really urge you to um, go to their website or call the Lymphoma Research Foundation um, with various questions. They can help direct you um, to resources that will help you. And in particular, what they have that I think is so exceptional is that there are so many lymphoma specialists throughout the country who love the LRF and who work hard um, with the LRF, LRF to help bring whatever patients need um, to them, basically. So the LRF really has these resources where it can contact um, physicians like me who love um, doing um, whatever patient advocacy work I can do. I, I care about the patient number one and I wanna do everything I can to help make the experience of, of lymphoma diagnosis and treatment easier for patients. And I think that LRF is really good at connecting patients to physicians or to other resources that will be helpful for them.